Woke up in an empty bed, he was gone. Radio keeps playing his Same man in the subway at the same damn time. I got sick of living this mundane life. Oh. Wait for the cue, you know. <laughs> Count me in. We ready? Okay. Good morning, everybody. Morning, morning, morning. You know what? I am really impressed with everyone in this room today. Uh, they have not been lured by the beauty of the beaches, <laughs> swimming with turtles. Uh, actually, now I feel bad for our online audience. Uh, there are no <laughs> beaches and no turtles here. Uh, so... <laughs> So um, welcome this morning on uh, day three of our conference. Uh, we have a great panel today um, of, with three speakers. Uh, I have the honor of introducing all three. Uh, the first is Sergio Pande. Um, after an international career as a corporate banking executive, Sergio is now determined to increase the ethnic diversity across senior corporate layers. Together with over 15 mentors coming from underrepresented ethnic groups themselves, uh, Sergio co-founded the leadership development program Roots Inspire, rootsinspire.com, <laughs> just so you know, uh, to accelerate ethnically diverse talent in senior corporate positions. Their clients include top employer brands such as AMB, AMRO, Unilever, banks that I cannot pronounce, uh, but important um, institutions. So it's great to have uh, somebody with uh, practical know-how really trying to uh, transform institutions. So welcome. Oh, not too bad, actually. I thought like this thing would be way too low for me. It's not too bad. No, thanks for having me. Um, is the distance good? You can hear me fine. Cheers. Yeah, I wanted to actually kick off, uh, because we're here in a small group, I wanted to kick off with something completely different, actually. So before I properly introduce myself, I want to share a personal, very personal story. Um, my mom actually passed away less than a year ago, uh, July. She was here from the island. Um, she left the island when she was 17 years old had uh, moved to Suriname with my dad. My dad is from Suriname. That's where my brother and me were born. And then she moved to the Netherlands. Um, that's where we were raised. My mom raised us um, as a single mom on a secretary's salary. And, um, you know, after working all her life, 67 years, she uh, was diagnosed with lung cancer, never smoked. And a few weeks later, she passed away. Now, back then I was living in Singapore. So I flew in from Singapore um, and here I was uh, visiting her while she was in the ICU. And I was waiting downstairs in the uh, hospital lobby when a man approached me. And he went up to me and he said, hey, are you here for the cleaning crew job? Right? Uh, yeah, like you guys right away know what I mean, right? <laughs> So here I was with all my emotions and, uh, you know, I could have snapped on the guy, but then I thought like, hey, you know, let's give this guy a break. He's probably there. He's, he's meeting somebody that's there for the cleaning crew job. He's looking around. There's all, you know, it's only white people and then there's me. So it was the natural assumption, right? Now, why I share this story is because we can, um, you know, if, if we're talking about physical attributes, right, whether it's gender or it's uh, skin color or it's race or um, eventually it, it comes with tons of assumptions, right? We can, we can think about it and say, like, that's a good thing. That's a bad thing. But that's just how our brain works. It's just, you know, it's just factual, right? So my story is about breaking the vicious cycle. Um, Really, um, I'm a bit uh, sorry about that because you know it still brings up it still brings up uh, some emotions. But um, 
really, you know, if you're if you're a person of color and you work in a Western corporate world, it's going to be a big part of your career, right? It's not always good. It's not always bad, but it's definitely it plays a very big role. And uh, today my talk is about breaking the vicious cycle. It's about how a lack of representation at the senior layers, how that creates this vicious cycle that's very hard to break through. And I'm going to go into sort of why and and what, um, and also how I think we can we can solve it. So yeah, so so maybe like. Um, just to introduce myself a bit further, indeed, I come from a banking career. I'm not a researcher like yourselves. Uh, so a lot of this is sort of, you know, experience and, and what, of, what, what we see in the field, what works, what doesn't work. Um, and uh, I spent 18 years in banking, 10 years in Amsterdam, eight years in Singapore. I had various leadership positions in, you know, leading products, leading client groups, all the good stuff. But then two years ago, when basically when George Floyd happened, I thought like, okay, let's, you know, let's really do something. Let's do something uh, constructive. And we started this platform called Roots Inspire, which is a leadership development platform focused on ethnic talent in the corporate environment. It's not early stage talent. It's talent that's a bit further along in their career and really we help them break through to the senior corporate layers. Because in my view, and that's also what this talk is about, if we fix it at the top, then it will sort of trickle down into the organizations. Um, and we work with amazing companies. We have uh, you know, Unilever, Bank of America, CBRE, Oliver Wyman, Baker McKenzie, uh, Boots. Uh, like we have tons of blue chip names now. And we've only been up you know, a year and a half. So it's it's really growing rapidly. We have about 150 people on the platform. And really the core of it is that we, we show the role models. So we have 70, we call them ethnic corporate leaders. They're people in leadership positions coming from ethnic backgrounds themselves. We have a few from the island actually as well um, that have roots here. We have Choi Lin who's in the board of ABN Emerald. Um, and is a Yudha Kursal. Uh, so I think quite an accomplishment from somebody from a small island like this. We have Ferenc Lamp, who is the head of the Benelux for Bank of America, uh, also roots here. So, you know, it's an island that produces a lot of talent as well. Um, let me get into it. I'll go into sort of, you know, the, the, what it is, why it's important, and then, you know, how can we tackle this? Yeah, so if we talk about, you know, the vicious cycle, I mean, honestly, what it is, is you're there in the evening, 10 p.m., working hard, finishing off this presentation that you need to finish tomorrow, and there's this little devil on your shoulder that says, you know, what are you doing this for, really? Because it's not like you're going to get a break. It's not like you're going to break through to leadership, because look at them, right? There's nobody there that looks like you. And this little devil on your shoulder that is creating doubt. I mean, sometimes it's, you know, conscious, sometimes it's even subconscious. Uh, you know, imposter syndrome is, I think, a big thing in, in, in this group. Um, and that doubt, that doubt then leads to frustration. And that frustration just leads to, you know, a lack of engagement, a loss of engagement. And, and people either get stuck because they're like, okay, it's not going to happen, but I get a good salary. You know, this is sort of my, my limit. So they're not even trying to um, go to the top layers or they just leave. They say, okay, this is not for me. I'm going to work for a smaller company. Big corporates are not my thing. And the problem is five years later, all your talent sort of, you know, get stuck somewhere. And five years later, you have the same problem. So this is really what we see as a big issue, um, uh, which just is a vicious cycle, right? So, so how do you deal with that? I think before we go into sort of how we deal with it, it's important to realize, you know, why it's important. Because I think very often in the whole DNI space, we 
you know, we're a bit confused about the why. Um, and to me uh, personally, I think my why is there's untapped potential. Um, I, I talked about um, employee engagement. You know, I think having that senior representation, it gets the engagement going of so many people that maybe, you know, you're not even aware of that they look at you and they're like, wow, this guy is doing it, this lady is doing it, but they're there and it triggers that engagement. Um, and then, you know, we talk about diversity of thought. And I think it's something that, you know, everybody understands is a good thing. But if you think about what it is, it really comes from a diversity of perspectives, right? Perspectives, when you look at something and, and, and you just have different life experience that make you look at things differently. So I think, you know, if we, if we think about the why and if we focus on untapped potential, then this is a big one. But then again, um, I, I'm not sure if you guys saw, I think yesterday, that email from Elon Musk uh, to the Tesla employees. So he basically sent an email. He said, look, it's uh, either you're 40 hours per week in the office or we assume that you resigned, right? Now, this, this obviously triggers uh, you know, a corporate culture of it's my way or the highway, right? So I would say that that corporate culture in Tesla is probably not a culture where they can challenge the boss and, but they're uber successful, right? So sometimes also we need to think about, you know, what we want. It's not like we don't want diversity for diversity. And even if you think about diversity of thought, it's not always that easy, right? If there's an African saying, um, that's that saying, um, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I think that is applicable here, right? Like obviously Elon Musk wants to go fast. So it's his way, everybody same direction and they can go fast. But that means you can go really fast in the right direction. You can also go really fast in the wrong direction, right? So it's what you want as a company and, and, and really sort of embracing that and then thinking about how, how can we accomplish that and how does diversity and inclusion play a role in that? I think the, the flip side of, of um, really the why is the risk management part. Um, it's one of the buzzwords in, in corporate life, uh, war on talent, everybody's talking about war on talent. And when we talk about, you know, upcoming talent now, diversity and inclusion is a very important aspect for them. You know, they're looking at companies, seeing what they're doing. And, um, you know, if you don't get it right, you're missing out on that talent. Um, but also, I think over time, you will really see a shift on between companies that you know, getting are getting this right and companies that are not getting this right, right? Because if you're not getting this right, eventually you will lose touch with your employees, you will lose touch with society and you will lose touch with your clients as well. Um, so for me, if you look at diversity, not from, you know, a moral obligation perspective, because a moral obligation, that's something, that's a charity. That's something when you do when, the business is running, we're making money, what else can we do, right? But if you look at it from a perspective of what does it bring to the table? What is the value add? Then all of a sudden it's not agenda point nine in the meeting, it's agenda point one, right? And I think getting the why correct is important to, to get the success. So then we go into what organizations can do. I think, you know, if you have, and, Almost all uh, organizations, big organizations have this. Now, if you have a lack of representation in the senior leadership, you can get those role models externally. Right? You can invite speakers. You can invite trainers that come from ethnic backgrounds. You can you know, work with a program like ours on mentoring, where you showcase that one is they are there. There are successful people of color you know, in organizations, and we need to showcase them. Um, but also, I think you show as a company that you understand the problem, right? And you're, you're working on it. You're saying like, hey, here, here they are, get inspired, get, you know, uh, learn about their experiences and, and um, take that to your benefit. 
Um, external peer groups. To me, that's a very important one. I think the journey of an ethnic professional, and that's sort of the terminology we use, right? Because terminology is very, very complex in this space because every country there's different terminology that's used and that's sort of acceptable, but we use um, ethnic. Um, but um, peer groups, it's a, it's a very lonely experience often, right? Very often there's nobody in the family that has any clue what corporate life is like, what, what you're dealing with. None of the friends that you grew up with have an idea. So you're really doing this on your own. So I think creating peer groups within the company, but also external peer groups to show that, you know, the grass is not greener somewhere else. It's, it's something that other companies are, are dealing with as well. I think that's a very important aspect um, to help in this. And then visibility and soft skills. Now, this is, to me, this is the most important one that I'm going to show because if you drill down and, and with us, so, you know, everybody has to fill in their learning goals. And, um, and, and I basically, I talk to everybody that's on the program, right? So uh, 160 people there, I've talked to everybody. Um, the common theme I see is that the visit, they feel overlooked and they're not visible to senior management. And then if you drill down on the why, it's a very natural thing as well. Like you've come into an organization, you're like, wait a minute, I'm the odd one out here. How does this work? How, how am I gonna be successful? And then the natural reaction is, okay, I'm gonna keep my head down. I'm gonna try to blend in and I'm gonna focus on the work. I'm gonna deliver quality work and that work is gonna speak for me, right? Now, the problem with this is that that strategy actually works, right? The first five years in your career, it works. And you get your promotions and everybody's happy. You're delivering great quality. But then you get to those leadership levels. And then it's a whole different game. And that's where people get stuck. Because now it's about who are your sponsors in the company? Do you have those relationships? Do you understand the corporate politics and how to navigate that? You know, are you visible to senior management? Do you have your personal brand that people know, you know, who you are and what you're good at? And I think that's where, you know, you can, you can work with talent to, to, you know, provide them those, those trainings, those skills. We do it through mentoring and workshops, but there's other ways to do it. Um, and actually, you know, if you look at the reasons um, for success. It's really that aspect of it that's very often, yeah, there's just not uh, enough attention put to it um, by the individuals themselves as well, right? Um, then sponsorship programs, I think sponsoring, breaking through to leadership, having the sponsors, that's the core, basically that's, that's the thing you need. But this group is often under-sponsored, right? Because a sponsor wants to sponsor somebody that is their image. Right? You want to help your younger self break through. And here, that's not the case. And then if you look at sort of the ethnic corporate leaders that are there, for them, it is the case, but it's a bit scary, right? Because are you now helping the Black guy just because he's Black and you're Black, right? It's, it's something that we... Um, in, in leadership feel a bit, you know, awkward about, so we're not sure how to do this. And I think it's, um, it's a difficult one because sponsorship is earned and not given, but I think um, organizations can do a lot to facilitate that and make sure that those relationships do happen, um, but not an easy one. Last one I put on here is recruitment is not enough. Often you see this dynamic where we talk to companies and they're saying, yeah, I love your program. I'd love to do this, but you know, we don't have the numbers, right? So we're all focused on recruitment. But if you're focused on recruitment, meanwhile, the professionals that you do have feel overlooked, feel, you know, not in their place. You're just, you know, in Dutch, they say you're mopping with the tap open, right? It's, it's, uh, you're just wasting money. You're getting all these people in, they're going to leave in, in one year, two years, three years, because they're not, feeling, um, you know, that they can be successful there, right? So I think uh, focusing on talent management and then recruitment complementary to each other, I think is an important one. Um, 
that's all for me. I, I, I one closing remark. Um, I think if we think about the vicious cycle, right? The good, the good news about that is that if you are able to break through, and if you are able to get that senior representation, then it actually starts to reverse, right? Because now external talent sees that senior representation, and you become the employer of choice, right? And the talent that is there is. Uh, more engaged, and that makes them more confident. And if they're more confident, they become more visible. And then your leadership bench will start to sort of form itself, right? So I think it's a problem that actually that absolutely can be solved. And, and we're doing sort of our part in that. But there's, um, you know, there's, plan there's it's, it's not easy, because uh, otherwise, it would have happened uh, a long time ago. Um, but we're going to get there. Thanks. Wonderful, thank you very much. Great presentation. Uh, lots for us to think about how we can uh, apply some of these uh, frameworks for our own organizations uh, and the uh, people that we work with. So thank you very much. Uh, our second presenter today uh, comes all the way from Australia, uh, but he's not all the way from Australia. <laughs> um, Mariano Pitosh Hayden, uh, he is an associate professor of strategy and international business at Monash Business School, where he's the director of the PhD program uh, in the Department of Management. Uh, he holds a PhD from the Rotterdam School of Management. Um, uh, prior to his time in Australia, oh no, prior to Monash, he was at Newcastle Business School, uh, where he was recognized with the Vice Chancellor's Award for Research uh, and Innovation Excellence. Uh, he's been awarded over 700,000 uh, Australian dollars in funding over his career, uh, including the prestigious ARC Discovery in Early Career Research Award. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have him here uh, and to um, speak to us today. So thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, tough act to follow. So let me see. I think I have this somewhere. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so good morning, Pitosh Hayden from the, the Monash Business School uh, in Australia. Glad to be back here. Glad to be back home. Uh, so a little gems as well that I did my undergrad here. At UOC, so it's very, uh, it's interesting route. So when you know you go all the way across the world just to find your way back home, right? So maybe it's a boomerang analogy in there somewhere, right? But <laughs> it's too early, and I haven't had enough sips of my coffee yet. Um, when related to the topic of the conference, you know, I'll, I'll be talking to you a little bit about this uh, regulatory interventions in our efforts at improving diversity in corporate leadership roles. Complementing, uh, you know, the previous presentation, it's more where it was more organically. There are also external forces at play, especially through diversity quotas for leadership roles, and this is a very, very contentious issues happening, uh, happening all over the world. Now, one of the issues, one of the problems with it is that, as contentious as it is, they're happening. Okay, we can agree, disagree. In the meantime, there's a rollout. A lot of people don't even know there's an EU-wide policy in place for a 30% representation target by 2028. Nobody wants to talk about it because no one's close to beating it, but it's already in place, right? So my work, generally, I, I dabble in strategic leadership space. I would usually um, I'll walk you through that in a second. Where does this project fit? I was... Um, We've been working on this topic for probably eight years or so. In 2017, 2016, 2017, I was awarded uh, this big grant by the Australian government, by the taxpayers. Uh, and the project was involved around, okay, how do we actually make diversity quotas for leadership positions work? The core premise was not good or bad, very dispassionate strategic approach to it. How do we make them work? They're happening. So basically taking a very complex social problem, problem, breaking it down to a straightforward strategic analysis from 
change in the environment adaptation at the organization level. All right, so that's the mindset we're coming in from uh, because they're all, they're, there's a lot of legal takes on it, feminist takes, and we want to bring a more pragmatic strategic take into the whole conversation. And the project has different elements. The one I'll be talking about today relates more to the first part in this flowchart, which is about how to improve representation. A representation is a necessary but insufficient condition, but it's a start. We need representation first and foremost, like we just heard as well. So we first have representation, then we have participations, and then we have implications of it. Today I'll focus on, on the representation, but I'm happy for us to have a conversation, a uh, discussion on the other elements as well. Right, because just because you have someone uh, appointed to a leadership position doesn't mean they'll actually be able to have a voice and actually affect change that that's commensurate with their diverse perspectives. So, and then implications, which is my least, ironically from a strategist perspective, is actually my least interesting part about this. Because a lot of the debates around diversity and diversity quotas have been around the business case and performance implications. My thinking around that has changed a lot over the years, where I think now, and I'm going to show you analysis, you know, 20 years, 30,000, you know, data points, whatever. My thinking has shifted now to actually the moral argument is enough. The business case problem, the business case imperative is problematic for many reasons. One of that being that if you define something by its outcome, if the outcome doesn't exist, the merits of the, of the premise cease to be valid. Right. So if we don't have performance, then the business case doesn't hold. So the business case is problematic also for, for other reasons. Um, so one of the issues I wanted to highlight, and that's how my changing, my own changing has shifted. You know, As you engage with complex problems, your own understanding and position on the field changes as well. That's one drastic sh uh, change I've had. Well, I'll show you some stats in a bit on you know where it's working, how it's working. Um, and I'll give you a little hint. It's only kind of working, but... <laughs> You know, preempt that so to manage your expectations. Uh, and quickly, where does it fit in my in my research program? Very traditional uh, academic, just a professional nerd. Uh, that's what I do. Wake up, research. Wake up, write. That's that's it. Um, I do do a lot of interesting engagement stuff, but mostly traditional academic focused on uh, the scholarly work. That's the the lion's share of my uh, of my my reputation. What I'm known for. If you ask someone what I'm known for, they say, "Oh yeah, this guy is always publishing and stuff like that." Always trying. And basically, I have uh, three dominant uh, th uh, themes in my in my research program. We have strategic leadership, which basically is concerned with those at the top of usually large uh, publicly listed corporations. There's a data element of why we, we study those kind of companies. Um, and strategic leadership, there was usually anything related to CEOs, usually you have my attention. Um, it's politically incorrect. I can't say it now, but they used to say that uh, I have a thing for old white men, I guess against... <laughs> I don't want to get canceled over that nowadays, whether you say that, so I stopped. Um, and then we have the corporate governance aspect, which basically is how do we make or how do we guarantee that organizations are accountable, effective, and, and meet their goals, their duties to stakeholders. Uh, and the strategic part, the organizational uh, adaptation or strategic renewal. And this type of project fits somewhere in the middle at the intersection of these, these, these topics. And like I said, why is this important? First of all, because it's happening. This is something that has very tangible and very real implications for the priority, priority set for staffing at senior leadership positions. Okay. Funnily enough, I have this um, on, the, on the upper left quadrant uh, angle. I have this example of California. Did anyone follow the news what happened in California? So California was, you know, was I guess, the woke state. I don't know. Oregon, maybe one of the woke states in, 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 in the US, they passed one of these quota laws as well. Say, hey, we need representation on boards. Everyone said, yay, you're coming on board. Developments are happening all over the world. That's great. What happened two weeks ago? I'll give you a hint. They reversed it. <laughs> Can you imagine actually going through all the trouble of reversing a law like that? That probably pe companies weren't going to meet anyways. So, you know, from strategically, you know, a lot of things we, we a lot, a lot about strategy is picking your fights and you realize that this is a losing battle. Don't even bother with it. So why would someone, it, it takes a lot of effort to actually go against this, right? but apparently it did. So that's, that's um, in play now. So sorry, this is uh, the slides are a bit more than two weeks old. Uh, I haven't updated them. Yeah. Um, but 
but it's a lot of pushback. And, and how do you feel about gender quotas, quotas for corporate boards? Who's for them? Show of hands. You're hesitating? You're against them? Why are you against them? Why do you hate women? Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I just see. Is there a reason you're not for them? I'm serious. You don't? You don't have a take on this? Yeah? In between? Mm -hmm. Right now, so it's a deeper issue as to why women aren't being selected under the traditional or normal selection process. So a quota serves to increase their representation, but isn't sufficiently tackling any of the reasons why they would have been selected under the, or not selected, not selected yeah. under the old one. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah, so one of the biggest issues with quotas is they don't tackle the root causes, right? It's a band aid, right? Um, when Justin Trudeau was elected prime minister of Canada in 2015, he mandated 50% of his cabinet to be women. And uh, journalists asked him, you know, why don't you use a merit based system for choosing cabinet? And he said, finally, we are. And, <laughs> yeah, and, right. Uh, you know, after all these years of uh, what white dudes, yeah definitely and sometimes it takes that that agent of change to come in and just come and say hey let's let's break the you know break the cycle let's think about how let's think about a different way and um, sometimes even a shock to the root causes, like, okay, maybe we have to, we can't go to a slow approach. We actually have to intervene right now. That's one of the examples. We won't talk about this blackface thing, but other than that, that was very <laughs> pros and cons. No, 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 neither. <laughs> he is not. Um, yeah, so the, the point being, this is actually a hotly contested issue to this point by, by men, women, you know, different identities, identities. People actually are not very happy with this. Right. In part of the interviews I did, the group of, don't quote me, I'm going to record it. The group of people that were most opposed to uh, quotas or, or mandated representation were the women who made it to the, to the positions before quotas were introduced. I'm not publishing that paper. I have the data. This is not the hill I want to die on. <laughs> but I'm just sharing some. some yeah, I am not touching that. <laughs> I ha I ha no, I'm not touching that one not my battle uh, okay but <clears throat> and obviously in, in in Australia um there's a lot happening basically we had a, a a prime minister he was just elected out um who wanted greater uh female representation in the meantime he complete we fumbled a lot of bags but one of them was it was a complete harassment case sexual harassment in his cabinet a case you're kind of like oh no you know it's it, that particular politician was misunderstood. It wasn't like that. And, the, and then he comes out, yeah, we need more women. Bless you. When you're not creating safe spaces or you're not actually following up. So there's a lot of contradictory signals happening. You know, there's this, this the narrative and this actually what's being implemented and what's being enabled, if you will. <clears throat> more of a, a boring technical note. What do, we, what do we mean when we talk about the board of directors? Just, you know, those are the senior level of uh, organizations, they usually oversee the executive team. Uh, the ones who, uh, in the middle usually have the CEO or the chairperson. And at the top of organizations, you have a mixture of external actors and internal actors involved, depending on, on the board model. And these people have to decide, come together and bring expertise, reflect the populations they serve, and actually ensure that the, co the company or the organization fulfills its goals. Just a quick random note. And in part, from a strategic standpoint, one of the issues is that how hard could it actually be? So when you actually look at a lot of the, the targets or the quotas, or we call um, gender representation targets, most of them basically, it comes down to a compliance exercise. Effectively, and, 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 and this is from the, the very pragmatic strategy, 
basically could just appoint someone on paper. They basically have to attend one meeting a year and you can say, yeah, yeah, we did it. Yay. Right. So if you actually just wanted to comply to mandated representation, it actually wouldn't be that hard. Right. So the issue becomes why don't companies just do it? Because one of the biggest challenges with representation targets is, oh, we're just going to have token, token minorities being appointed in certain positions. Is it going to tell them, sit there, look pretty, don't rock the boat, check. I remember many years ago, um, I had some good friends in, 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 in the United Nations, and they had some form of quote as well, more generally. And I remember this particular person was telling me at the time that now everyone's looking for uh, a black blind lesbian in a wheelchair. You have that, that one, you know, they don't even have to show up. You just, you know, done. <laughs> You get all the points, all right? So if you, so it's you know when 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 these measures become just 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 targets, you know they do incite very very perverse type of behaviors in how you can do that, um, and that happens overall, right? There was a response we saw in in affirmative action, and which this is a variation of, but these cases are more visible. If you think about publicly listed corporations, we have named officers. We know who these people are. The people who represent our interests. They have to report them. This we know who they are. We can find information about them. So we can Google them. We can look at their LinkedIn profile. Like, what does this person look like? Literally. So when you think about it, it's like, how hard could it be, really? The fact that we don't meet these targets must reflect other attributes, other dynamics, and um, at play. Sorry. Some quick examples in the UK. Um, only forty-one percent of FTSE one hundred companies met the 25% target for the board, initially set in uh, 20 or to come, um, come in play for 2015. And if you think about the average board being, you know, seven to eight people, it's not a lot. Asking two of them to be, you know, to be women. Doesn't seem like a lot to ask. Uh, Canada originally had the opportunity to have <laughs> He said, you know what? You can nominate how many, what's the percentage you think is appropriate. Right? Come up with a target you think is sensible to your company. And only about 14% of the companies you know, came up with it and, and complied. Like you could have literally said one. Right? Again, it's not going to be that hard. Australia is another one. It, it's in the meantime, the target of 30% has been met. It is 30.2%. Uh, so Yay. Um, not going to talk about the margin of error in these measurements. Um, and, and, and again, in, in India was interesting as well. In the months before the compliance deadline, they appointed daughters, sisters, wives, anyone they could find to the board. The response was so pathetic that they actually had to extend the deadline. They said, come on, guys, like, seriously? We it's not that hard, but don't make it that obvious. Right? So um, these are the dynamics that are happening uh, all over the world. And I'll, and I'll spare you all the, the boring stats around this, but I'll, um, I'll talk a little bit about some findings about one of the, the, the major projects we've had in this advanced stage of um, academic revision. A couple of quick things. We favor the term gender representation targets instead of quotas, so GRTs, uh, because quotas are about of one possible configuration of getting uh, greater um, gender diversity or diversity more generally on board. So a couple of other specifications, we'll see if we get to that in a bit. The second one as well, which I think nowadays the conversation has shifted a lot in the eight years since I started working on this topic, when we talk about gender, actually talk about sex in this particular case. So actually now there's other layers of complexity added to that, when we talk about gender representation, we're not only talking about binary sex assigned at birth anymore, but for the purposes of this project, we still have those assumptions. Um, let me quickly, to that. quickly show you the, the research team working with Nikos, Yana, and Skiba. And why do we have these things? Right. Because it's hard to tackle the root causes. We know this, right? Um, while this is happening, we have these immediate calls for action through representation targets. And usually they come into play 
you know, this idea of rectifying systemic underrepresentation, like how do we fast track that? We also have increased participation of underrepresented groups. And then we have the, the business outcomes, social and financial and economic outcomes. That's usually been the main driver. Oh, we need to do this because it's good. Uh, sorry, because it's good for business, right? So it, it's scary. And you know my view on that. By the way, the business case is still heavily debated, right? So um, the best the best outcome we have, if you actually want to go by the financial outcomes, maybe you know two or three percent increase in financial performance. The problem is, it's that it's the companies already doing well that manage to appoint women to the board. So the results are very confounded. So when you actually look at the data. It, the stories are not as exciting as they are, right? Reality is, is messy. But pretty much we have, when we talk about gender representation targets, there's three dimensions of them. We have a target percentage or number that we have to meet, it's a magic number, right? Then we have a timeline for adoption, the very, in that, and also the sanctions for non-compliance. What happens if you don't meet the target? Most cases, nothing. So in a, in a couple of places, it's interesting, in most, in Australia, in UK, Canada, we had comply or explain. Now, you know, you're dealing with very smart people, <coughs> explain, yeah, they'll tell you. We actually had an honest look into narratives of explanations. And it's all about, you no, know, we're having great efforts at diversity and inclusion, and we're trying really hard, and we're working on improving the pool, and then they, they sneak in some uh, flawed merit argument in there. Right? It's, there's a pattern in how they, they answer these nowadays. It's probably copy paste from the year before. Um, not very not very interesting at all. So um, in the other places, the original case was in, in Norway. If, um, if you didn't meet the targets, you could actually get liquidated. Yeah. What do you think companies did? That was it. They found some companies found tokens. So the to the, the concept of a token woman just here, hey, hey, check. They share directors. The well, who was I talking to about? This is not my term, the golden skirts. We were talking about it over lunch the other day, right? So um how we've improved representation at individual companies, but the same, the same number of directors in the pool. So we haven't increased the pool. It's just the same women holding multiple directorships. Yep. So when we count it, the way you count it, it seems like that's the Australian problem. You seem like you met the target, but in reality, you haven't really improved the pool or you haven't included more. Uh, you don't have a more diverse pool, pool to recruit from. That's one thing. So fun fact, companies delisted because of the, yeah, so because it was only applicable to publicly listed companies. Companies went so far that they couldn't be bothered doing this. They would rather delist then face the consequence of not a point. Yeah. In other places, like uh, I think in Spain now, if you don't meet the targets, you have, you, you're not allowed to bid for government contracts, right? So that's somewhere in between a hard and a soft target. In France, you have this idea that directors actually may not be able to get a pay increase in common directors. So that's actually helped a lot. If, <laughs> they, they went very micro with it like very micro like you know if you don't do this you know you don't get your bonus next year and it's like you know what this is an important topic we should talk about it <laughs> and then we can talk and so it's it's actually but um it, it's a topic that gets very frustrating pretty quickly once you get deeper into it um when you see all the creative responses versus the ability we have it we have to just do the right thing right here to the point that I'm thinking like, it's probably easier. Someone's kind of lazy, it's like easier, just, just do it. You know, and, and then there are also different ways of meeting the targets. So some companies met the targets recently, but letting some of the, the um, companies see the, the old chair retired and they didn't replace it. So by calculation, they increased the representation because they have a smaller board. And they had like one or two women on the boards already. So there are different sneaky ways of going around the numbers and, and, and making them work uh, for you. Uh, so let me, let me, I know I'm happy to share these slides by the way, if anyone wants them, because there's a lot of movements happening. So in, in the US, France, Netherlands, Germany, Switzerland, 
Japan. So there's a lot of movements around corporate governance interventions more generally, and these are now becoming... Uh, so governments meddle in corporations all the time. And it, it's always been usually a way of guaranteeing their, their, you know, their taxes. But now there's also a social component to it as well, a representation. And the idea being that you're trying to foster or accomplish what has not happened organically. And when we don't have it, so my view on quotes has changed uh, over time. I used to think the merit argument had legs, but now I realize that if you don't, if you remove these, these criteria, you, you revert back to previous state pretty quickly. Even with them in place, we have creative solutions. So are they fully effective? Maybe not. Are they less of many evils? Perhaps. All right, let me... Let me go to the just the findings. You'll, you'll have to trust me on the data. Actually, probably the coolest thing, um, it's, it's a very nerdy, nerdy that we, we, I really like the analysis. But I'll skip. By the way, fun fact, what was the first, first country to have gender diversity quotas for corporate boards? I'll buy your coffee. Yeah. <laughs> I probably won't, but sorry? No. Japan is horrible. Japan is like, they don't even, re, re, yeah, they don't. Close, close. Yeah. Israel, 1999. Yeah, yeah, Israel. It's it's been popularized by by the Nordic approach. So the Norwegian and Danish kind of kind of approaches are the popular ones. So we take, but it's actually pioneered in, in in Israel. Admittedly, Israel also lets women serve on the front lines, right? So this different gender dynamics happening <laughs> happening there as well. So just a fun fact, tell your friends. Let me get to the findings. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's a left censored mixed effect Tobit model with control function for endogeneity level. So we did a, an analysis that, to the best of our knowledge, is the most comprehensive done uh, done to date. So we we analyzed about almost nineteen counties that have reached compliance dates as of two years ago. So in the meantime, we have to update the data that reach compliance dates because you need fun fact, five years ago, you wouldn't have been able to do the study because you simply didn't have enough companies to have reached compliance to see if it worked, right? So we're just very fortunate with our timing that, you know, we're the first people to actually be able to do this and actually had the resourcing to sort of hopefully pull it off, right? Because it's a five-year project, you know, the, the, the investment is so crazy. Even figuring out that table I showed you with the different kinds, that's probably the most, the thing everyone wants, Figuring out what are the quotas across the world or the targets across the world, no one has an overview of that, right? So it's very hard to figure out and also, you know, legislation in different languages and like blah, blah, blah. Um, fun fact, having um, a target in place, just the presence of these things actually helps, actually helps uh, improve representation or in, at least in relation to target. Um, but the statisticians in the room realized that the effect is so small. I mean, it's significant, but it's so small to see, to, to, to question its economic meaning. It has statistical meaning, but economic meaning or the actual social meaning of it, we can wonder whether it's sufficiently enough. Given all the work that has gone into it, it's a pretty low return. Right? So we need to do better uh, more, more generally. Um, A couple of fun facts on the findings as well. Companies with women CEOs obviously tend to do better in, 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 in appointing. Um, there's two sides to it. On the one hand, we can the argument could be that having a, a woman CEO actually, you know, they they ride, they champion for the in a, they have an influence in appointment decisions. It could also be that companies that have women CEOs have different kind of cultures and process and, and, and practices that allow certain uh, groups to be in leadership positions in the first place. So it might be something else driving the effect. Uh, it's very hard, very difficult to tease out. Uh, and the other precursor is women in uh, parliament. So one of the controls we found a very strong effect, women in parliament positions. So countries that have more women in parliament tend to start pushing for these types of legislation. It takes, it takes a long time because most, most places don't even have quotas for, for parliament. Right, but those who do, it tends to be a precursor to these kind of dynamics. 
basically what we did in this, this particular study, we looked at countries with strong institutional backgrounds, so strong, well, strong rule of law, and those with less strong rule, rule of law. And basically we found that if you're in a place that has a weaker, weaker regulatory back or weaker, weaker regulatory setting, you wanna go high, fast and quantitative with your, with your representation target. So you wanna raise a high target, you wanna give short time for compliance and you wanna have quantitative penalties, right? So what's a place with a uh, I mean, not to places with weaker regulatory institutions frameworks in place. Places, places with stronger regulatory backgrounds, you actually want to go low, slow, and qualitative. Right? The problem, though, is that even though that approach to representation works better in places like Australia, in theory, in the numbers, so a lower target, usually around 20%, when we talk about slow, you want to give companies three to five years to comply, and you want to have comply, comply or explain sanctions. In practice, that leads to about an increase of an additional one woman on the board. So you improve it overall on aggregate, but you actually never fully reach the target in strong industries. So you actually, the marginal effect to economics, marginal effect is stronger in weaker institutional backgrounds. Right? Places that are very strong, established, actually struggle to change uh, a bit more. Right? So they show some improvement, but very little. So this is persistence, like this gap, like this, we call it the, the third woman problem, right? So everyone can get the first two. And if you have the first, the first one in, the second one is easier. Many companies try to get the third one on board. And we can have a discussion why, why, why that's the case, but lots of- They're struggling to get them on board or they're not doing it. And that's the debate we want, you know, we want to have. and. You know, I'll, I'll wrap it up on, on this point because, you know, with these kind of studies, we're looking at um, government or regulatory interventions to the functioning of for-profit firms. Right? When we talk about corporations, a lot these are companies that are, that are in place primarily to make a profit, okay? Or historically, they have been in place. But these are, we're not talking about social enterprises. These are public listed corporations. These are the companies your pension funds invest in so you can retire comfortably, right? We want them to do well, right? Uh, and more generally, why, I'm trying to understand why, why and where different specifications, different ways of setting up, how do we make it work? And it's about moving away from a one size fits all kind of approach. Okay, how do we tailor the specifications of representation targets? To even if it's not fully effective, having it better than it used to be. Right, having some form of progress over over, over perfection. Um, I'll actually leave it at that for now, as I can keep nerding out on it. Um, well, I would love to have a conversation with you. I don't know if it's now or later. Let's have it later. I have a conversation with you about uh, different remaining questions, issues, and potential solutions or alternative explanations for some of the patterns uh, I've highlighted here. And as always, happy to set, uh, share the slides or any of the materials you wish now or in the future. Thank you very much. And I'll, you know, pass with Phil. Thank you again for another uh, thought provoking presentation. Uh, and uh, you know this idea of causality uh, is is uh, so important, uh, and uh, I think we have a little tension here on um, on on causal effects, which is going to be fun for the conversation <laughs> uh, later. Okay, so uh, I'm now going to introduce our third speaker, Guido Royer. I got that right. That's fantastic. Uh, he's a Lecturer in Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the University of Curacao. Uh, he's a seasoned expert on the role of talent in innovation and is currently writing up uh, his dissertation on entrepreneurship education in the College of University Curricula at UNED Madrid. Uh, he's currently fulfilling his second term as Deputy Treasurer of the ACU, the largest credit union in the Dutch Caribbean. Uh, Guido holds a graduate degree in innovation from Maastricht Graduate School of Governance and an undergraduate graduate degree from business in the University of Curacao. I welcome you to the stage. Uh, 
<laughs> Thank you very much. Um, you know, when you get that introduction, you oh, is that, that is that me? Is that really me? Do I do those things? Where's my time going? <clears throat> So uh, good morning. Uh, first and foremost, I want to welcome you again to Curacao. I hope uh, those that are um, following us uh, through the virtual channels get the chance to visit sometime in the future. Uh, I want to give a quick shout out to my colleague, Lisa Chong. Thank you, Lisa, for doing all this work. Lisa has been doing this work for two years. I didn't think you knew you were going to sign up for this much work. And uh, I'm very happy to see the conference realized and being part of it. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so, you know, when we talk about diversity and uh, we particularly talked about um, uh, gender, you know, it's three of us, three guys, three millennials uh, presenting. Uh, so that's kind of telling. Um, when we look at how we um, account for all that it is diversity, um, we don't only look at what we can see, but we need to look at what we cannot see which is a very, very difficult task. I think we talked about that in the panel uh, earlier this week. And we um, should start to think about how we build these systems in to make sure that it works because you know, just having people doesn't mean that they actually contribute. We've heard about, uh, we didn't get to go through all the data, but you know, it's important to have it work for the organization. Um, when I think about this, uh, I, I go back a few uh, years ago when we had the the Pepsi uh, ad with uh, Kendall. Was it Kendall Jenner? Kendall Jenner, you know, oh yeah, protesting. Like, what do you know about protesting? How can you represent and identify with the issues that actually are going through um, what we deem as minority? Because she's also a minority. We're not gonna um, take that away. Thank you. Take that away from her. But um, there's other things at stake that you might not feel identified to. So I'm talking today about invisible diversity. Um, it's It seems to be the central thing that we've all touched upon, but we didn't really get the chance to uh, talk about. And obviously this is a very new, uh, I'm throwing a wrench through the glass house here by doing this. Um, because it's this it's the one thing that we cannot put our fingers on right like how do you know that having this person to represent others actually going to make sure that the representation is taking place right um so i, I want to ask you um what comes out of this conference when you leave later on today what will you be uh branding this conference with when we talk about diversity well we talked about you know uh, the local, we talked about um, women, we've talked about gender, we've talked about uh, underrepresented minorities, but how do we relate to those minorities that we cannot see directly? So to this point, what will you take away from this conference? Anyone? I know it's Saturday morning. Um, some of you uh, are in, still uh, regurgitating last night, so it's okay. What will you take away from this conference? Yes. veterans that's one it's really invisible uh, diversity yeah that's uh very uh, i i know i looked at bitosh because one of the things that um you notice a, a great proportion of executives have a military background but it doesn't really um you know uh, uh account for um in the diversity checklist as, as we say what else do we take away invisible diversities yes Internal diversity, diversity of thought. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, we could be men, we could be women, you know, um, but we still might think alike. I mean, if, if it's uh, most likely uh, within the same generation, especially now, I feel that millennials are, think more alike than the previous generations because they have a lot of things that unite them. If I would put out a few memes right now, all the millennials would be like, hey, I know this. I saw that yesterday. Like we all follow the same accounts on Instagram. We all follow the same, uh, you know, handles. So it, it kind of makes sense. So we, we, we share that, that identity and it's invisible. Well, maybe if you look at our age, but, you know, some people are outside the age bracket, but still identify as millennials. I want to identify as Gen Z, you know. Um, you were going to say something. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, 
created the diversity. Mm -hmm. you know, we, it's always looking back historically, which of course it is a, a, a big concern of all this, but I know there are institutions that allow for diversity uh, 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 that is unknown uh, mm -hmm. at the time. Yeah, so it's 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 a precursor to to get to that diversity. Yeah, well, that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to share with you some of these slides might be uh, uh, similar to you've seen it in my presentation uh, earlier this week. I have a challenge because I have to. Uh, I stand at this podium. I teach in this lecture hall. Uh, students that are living on an island. And when I talk about businesses, most of the books come from uh, Western Europe, the United States, and they refer to large enterprises as defined by having more than a thousand employees. But if you talk to someone from Curacao, a large enterprise would be more than a hundred employees. There's a very, very big gap there. Um, when we talk about competition in larger markets, you actually have competition here. I think uh, I, I'm a member of the Rotary Club. The, the, all the CEOs of the banks are fellows at the same Rotary Club. And I think they have a WhatsApp group where they make jokes about each other and they just cooperate. So there's not really a competition there. Um, the labor market. Uh, when we talk about the labor market here on the island, it's very limited because you get what you have. Whereas in other markets, there's a lot more movement. There's active labor market policies. People have choices and mid-career switchers and things that are not very much present here. And the job market here is very, very simplified. You either... You know, you're a lawyer or you're an economist, so to speak. And in our case, you're an accountant. And it's very difficult to get that extra diversity. I, I, I have friends, for example, that I've learned a lot from that are anthropologists, archaeologists. You've seen one yesterday um, that contribute a lot to the way I perceive things. And I, my background as a, as a business scholar, um, sometimes, you know, when you hear something for the first time, you're like, oh, no, yes, yeah, it's it's... it's when you give it a chance and then you see, oh, maybe they have an ounce of truth. And then you, you go through it again and you know, they're right. They're just right, plain right. And um, if we are to design organizations to have these thoughts to fit in, I don't think we would, we would think, oh yeah, you know, we, we have that archeologist that said that one thing one time and invite them to, to be part of this organization to contribute and make it better. And even if you get there, and you want to invite this person, will they accept, right? Because you want to get that, that, that different diversity. So we have a gap, a big gap actually. Um, and particularly for island environments, I want to contribute with that. It's, you know, you, we're here in a small island developing state or as we are known now, large ocean states. Um, we're underrepresented in business studies. So this is one of the challenges I face every time. How do I make sure that people um, are able to apply what we've examined them and assess them on in real life on an island. Because that's the one thing all our students tell us, you know, like half of what we were taught, we could not apply. And not because it was under not valuable, but it was not applicable to the real situation here. And we're also often misunderstood because we are thought to be small versions of large countries. No, we are the, you know, sizable version of this country. We have our history. It's it's equally valid. And you know, um, I had this discussion with someone uh, at the immigration department where we were talking about the digital nomad policy. And I said, why do we make it difficult for people to come to Curacao? We need to make it easier. And then this person said, and I'm I'm totally in agreement with uh, with her. She said, well, if you want to go to the United States, you have to comply. If you want to go somewhere else, you have to comply. What's wrong with us having to ask people to comply? And it's a very powerful sense because, you know, we are our government. We're, we're small, but it doesn't mean we're less, right? And um, for me, the interesting thing is that over the years um, of doing research, we still find novelty on islands. So um, this island is the place where we have the most female prime ministers. Our first female prime minister was in 1979. Um, maybe it was by chance because she was married to <laughs> the first prime minister, but she's still the first female prime minister in the region. You know, we when we talk about Eugenia Charles, which is the first elected uh, female prime minister in the Caribbean, we still have, you know, our card that we can say we, we did this. But do we want to have a card to say we did this? Or do we want to uh, showcase really how we did this and why we did this? 
So when we talk about diversity, we talk about the obvious. Uh, when we joke about diversity in Curacao, it's just not something that she should be joking about. But when we we have this picture, it's always the United Colors of Benetton uh, uh, ad, right? Oh yeah, we're kumbaya, everyone's together, and we look so different, but we you know still buy from this Italian brand. Um, we talk about gender, race, ability or disability, sexual orientation. You know, it's Pride Month. Um, every company has uh, their logo on LinkedIn with a rainbow flag, but they still donate to groups that are anti-LGBT. You know, it happens. So what do we really want in diversity? And then um, this year, I was introduced to a song. Uh, I'm going to ask you this question. What's the difference between these two glasses of water? You can't tell. You can't tell, really. And then the song that I was introduced to this year was, it could be water, it could be rum. So you have a hard time trying to figure out which one is which, right? And this is what um, we need to realize when we're trying to respond to the need for diversity. What is what we want to achieve? Do we need representation? What, what, is, what does representation mean? Just have people and um, uh, give the example? Then yes, we can do that. But if we really want to go the extra mile, or how I would call it, the real mile, in having people give their opinions and shape the organization in ways that would um, attract um, or ride the wave of development over time, then we need to really figure out which one is water and which one is rum. I would go for the rum, just to give you my preference. And what are invisible um, characteristics? Well, background is one of them. Um, we all have a small island background, but it's all different. Um, if you would put me in a, a for-profit organization, I would, might not be really uh, working or functioning because my mind doesn't function like a for-profit organization. I function in the form of public knowledge and things that in general enhance other um, uh, organizations. My friend here worked in the bank, so he has a for-profit or, um, orientation, you know, but we still have the same background. It's important that we realize that even though we look at backgrounds, we need to dissect, is it water or is it rum? Experience. Oftentimes, um, younger people, um, no, actually, let me turn it around. People with years of experience often get credited, oh, it's 40 years of experience. But if you've been working 40 years in the same job, that does not mean your experience trumps someone with 10 years that has flipped roles. I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm just saying that experience varies depending on which factor you're using to analyze. Is it water? Is it rum? Feelings. Um, this one is it hits home because... How do you feel engaging with your work? Some people uh, or, uh, with organizations, particularly people within the organization. One of the things that I think is the red line, the red thread between the three presentations this morning is that we make such an effort to get people on board and not so much in keeping people on board. You know, it's this thing about internal branding that one of my students actually taught me. If you, you have a restaurant and you pretend to be this luxury restaurant or you pretend to be this uh, fast casual restaurant and the service doesn't match what you pretend to be outside, then you're not genuine. You're not doing what you're saying you're doing. Oftentimes it requires you to do the internal branding because it could be the shack, the shackiest shack ever. But if your service is high quality, people will recognize you as that high quality place. So internal branding is important. And this means how do you deal with the feelings that are um, boiling within the organization that you're helming, right? How do I get that angry person that is very productive under these circumstances to, to unangry and produce? Um, to point out another item that we talked about in the earlier panel, language, right? Um, diversity in language is something that's very important because we think differently based on um, the languages we know and how we can relate concepts to each other. Um, if a certain, we, we had that discussion uh, yesterday at the dinner table, um, 
in Dutch, this is there's this word that says gunnen. To to uh, there's no translation for it really in English. It's a favor or to give the benefit to someone uh, or, or, or credit, goodwill. In our language, in Papiamento, it doesn't exist. So how can you apply something that doesn't exist in your frame of reference? And language is something that is quite present, but how many people actually know a language? And, and it's uh, funny to see when people uh, speak, I notice if they know the language or they're translating on the spot. If you know, there's this difference between Sofia Vergara speaking English and someone else speaking English, she's translating and this person's really thinking in that language. Um, how do we get this out? Because this also contributes to the, indivis in the invisible diversity that makes up the organization. I think I've already spoken about interpretation, um, using language as a vehicle. Um, another thing that's the thinking pattern. Yes, what we discussed. Some people have a different approach <laughs> towards resolving whatever problem they have in front of them. And then application. Um, if something doesn't exist in your country, in your environment, it's very difficult for you to be able to replicate that. And I have the perfect example. Uh, my father, he traveled to Brazil and he wanted to buy coconut, coconut water, you know, refreshing. And the guy cut a piece off the coconut so he could level and then make the perforation so they could drink. And my dad said to me, well, you know, that guy has a master's degree in coconuts. Because I would have never figured that out because coconut is not part of my environment all the time. And this is very, very telling because we sometimes, particularly in business, we expect everyone to have like this notion of how, what to do with marketing. But this notion of marketing is very, very American or Western European centered. Marketing in Latin America is something completely different because you have to make jokes. Uh, in, in Africa, um, there are other approaches towards getting engagement from people um, that might not necessarily be represented in the marketing books that we have today. So it's very important that we realize that diversity in application is also something that we should recruit on or you know try to represent. So this guy's job in the Netherlands is going to get a little bit more difficult with these invisible um, diversity items. But I think this is how it starts because there's a lot that we can um, make possible if we look, you know, to try to figure out if it's water or rum. And in terms of organization, uh, I can contribute with this. This is one of, one of the um, organizational forms that I like the most or as not like the most. It spoke to me when I was introduced to it. It's holacracy. It basically means that you don't have departments anymore. You have circles within the organization. And you don't have a manager. You have a lead. So a manager is really responsible, but the lead is the, the one that represents. And the lead changes every time because not everyone in the circle can contribute for specific topics every time in the same way. And you have a lead circle that leads the entire organization. So the leads from each circle would then delegate someone else to the lead circle every time in order to address issues that continuously pop up. And that way you can have, you very carefully, you can have a better representation because it is not always that the manager or the director really understands or lives, feels, thinks, interprets um, the diversity issues that are at hand in the same way. Um, to give you an example, one of our colleagues here at the university, she is a fantastic event planner. It's not Liza, by the way, someone else. She's very good at planning events and um, was kind of struggling how to do the job. When we talked to her about organizing her jobs as it were events, all of a sudden she understood the task. So, and based on that, I gave a speech once that says companies don't know what they know because had we not known that she is an event planner, we would have not been able to translate her job in event planning lingo for her to improve. So it also takes a little bit more information and seeking and, and understanding to get to that match. Otherwise, I think, Maybe in another organization, you know, we would have 
uh, parted ways unnecessarily. And in and this is also our, rea our, our reality on the island. We don't have a lot of people, so we have to make do with what we have. And this does not mean that we have a low quality. It means that we have diverse quality and we have to be inclusive by nature. And that's one of the takeaways that I want to give you uh, when you go back. What, you, what did you learn on an island? Well, even in limitations, you can uh, thrive, but you have to be inclusive. And with that, I wrap up. Thank you very much. And you can follow me on, uh, thank you. To continue the discussion and conversation and you can share memes, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter, the Sky Prof. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you very much. We'll have the three of you just uh, move to the front. And uh, while we do that, uh, I'm going to open the floor to questions, uh, discussion points. You know, I, I think even questions are probably a little bit too pointed right now. <laughs> so <laughs> um, who wants to go first? Who's the brave first question or comment <laughs> or engagement of it anyway? Yes. Hello. Uh, my question is for Patash. Um, how do you change the minds of the companies that are doing the bare minimum right now when it comes to meeting their diversity targets of any kinds, other than increasing the sanctions on them? Yeah, the very um, important question. Going back to the premise of what's the what's the root cause? How do we actually change the minds? And this idea that organizations have a mind or a culture that that we can actually uh, affect, that we can change. I have, it's a bit of a link. What's what do you think about? It? Because I know you had some thoughts on your experience at Dental, at Delta Delta Dental was, was right. So, how did you go about it? Because we can. It's it's if if we have to assume that organization has a mind, which kind of reflects its culture, mm -hmm. and then we have to change that. And we know that that takes a long, uh, a long time. That hence why we have these external interventions to shock to shock the change into place. With yeah. its with its challenges, obviously. I mean, my approach would be to alter the argument made to the leadership team. Um, so if I had a leader who saw it as a political game or saw it as, you know, a, a let's just get a woman on the board, let's just get someone of color on the board. Taking it back to, well, why why aren't they why aren't they there right now? What are you missing? What do we have in our talent pool? So my focus is very much bringing people up from within. So who do we have in our talent pool right now that you are completely not seeing, 100% invisible? Because just to touch on uh, kind of another piece, one of the elements that you happen you see when people mandate, you get the same people moving around. I think, Sergio, you and I were talking about this the other day. You get the same leaders moving around companies over and over again, which is not diversifying your thought process. <laughs> Uh, particularly, and is failing to grow your talent from within. Um, so when you have a tight deadline, let's say 2015, you've got to have you know, 25% of your, your women on the board and it's 2013. You're not growing from within in two years. So you're going to just pick the people who are already famous in the industry for having good management skills. So my approach would be to take it back to the leaders and ask, what are, you, what are we missing? What, if, what's our operational customer base? looking like what do we not have represented significantly there you know for us i think we talked about this before we have a huge marshallese population in arkansas we have zero marshallese employees that's not even a leadership issue that's just a down the line any employee issue so we don't have any marshallese voices in any decisions we make at any point so we can't make decisions for that community so i'd start there but that that requires extending the timeline out so you can't do it quickly Definitely, and and you spot on. And extending the timeline, uh, things take time. Uh, but the public list corporation has been around for eighty years. Mm. How much more time do we need to give companies exactly. to change? Right. So at some point, it's like, well, okay, you've had you've had a chance. So so one of the, the rationales for having diversity targets in the first place that it hasn't happened organic for many reasons. And you spot on uh, in the data we can we can see as well that you're more likely to appoint external hires. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned the term about you know the, the same group of women sitting on multiple boards that have experience that 
um, they're pre-vetted. Mm -hmm. You know, you know they're going to behave according to you know incumbent corporate um, uh, expectations, if you will. So it, it's an easier way because to foster that growth organically, you would have to create, for instance, uh, safe spaces for people to actually want to take on leadership roles. Mm -hmm. Being an executive, being a director, is a hard job, task-wise. Just remember the task, what you have to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Most people, men include, a lot of people don't want that. I got hustled into my directorship. I didn't want to do it. I just was too slow in responding to some emails to say I didn't want to do it. Um, so not everyone aspires to, 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 to these roles, but you have to create pathways and safe spaces and have support systems in, in place to allow uh, minorities broadly defined to make the, to get in these roles. To make it to add another layer of, of, of um, depression to this to this exercise is that women are, especially women, are more likely to be appointed in companies that are underperforming. We call it the glass cliff. All right, it's um, appointing women in precarious positions. And there are many reasons for that. Obviously, once things are tanking, say all of a sudden, yeah, we need diversity. Yeah, let's put <laughs> and, and the problem with that is that um, it's a sociological, a social psychological argument that you don't want to taint the status of the white man being a competent leader mm -hmm. in a company that's doing bad. Right? So you don't want to taint the stereotypical, the stereotype associated with, with corporate leadership. So that's when uh, you get younger minorities being appointed in these positions, usually when things are not really going well or when things are about to go, go, go sour. So even at times when we see companies meeting these targets, you say, hmm, and you look deeper into this, like, eh, mm -hmm. that, that's extremely uncomfortable. Right? So it, it's, it's a lot happening. And again, like I said, the, the external interventions are, if nothing else, I think the, the, the only reason they... I do feel one of the reasons I favor them is they force us to have the conversation, right? It force us to have that the conversation about okay, why even what are the root causes? Why don't we have internal internal development to these positions? Right? Hope that kind of tax we can keep going around, but yeah, it's uh, part of the answer. I hope. Right? Tosh, can I ask one follow up question from that to you? Actually, right on the is this thing on? Yeah, right. Um, on the data, right? Because you say the ones that meet the quota, you don't see a significant uptick in performance. But how old, you know, like wh what time frame do you look at? Because I would think it needs quite some time. You're breaking the barriers that starts to change the culture. And so it's going to take some time before that actually pays off. Definitely, there's, there's always a lag. And at that level, you're trying, uh, statistically, you're looking at two-year period from appointment to effect. So for instance, we have at the CEO level, the CEO effect, from appointment until you can see a tangible change in bottom line outcomes about two years, two to three years. Right? Uh, the problem being obviously that they only last in position for three to four years. So you kind of keep you know, resetting the cycle so you never really achieve anything. Uh, but it, it's very similar dynamic with 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 the directors as well, yeah. although they have fixed terms usually. But I would think for CEOs, the impact is much quicker than for directors, right? Because often people are appointed in um, you know positions that are more almost advisory positions, right? Like head of legal or head of compliance, or and not like driving the business. And then you know it takes some time before actually decision makers are there in the board. Um, and, and that's 100%. And, and, and again, let's make it even more depressing. Um, <laughs> women appointed to boards or minority more generally are more likely to come from staff positions. Mm -hmm. um, and part of this, the internal development is, um, and this is actually an actual, an actual issue. This is um, not a merit argument. There are less, uh, there are fewer women in operations roles. Uh, usually, the, the common path for CEO is operations, head of ops, COO, CEO, or finance tend to be male dominated more generally, right? Oftentimes you have um, a lot of women directors come from NGOs. NGOs or government roles end up a lot in the board's DEI committee. They end up in your you know, uh, ESG committee. Other roles that not, they don't end up in, in, in the finance remuneration committee. They don't end up in the nomination audit committee. Mm -hmm. So they end up on uh, peripheral 
type, type of important tasks, but they don't end up in, in the key decision to your point. They don't end up in, in that role. And that, that one we can trace back to, to ops. And there's actually this, this very cool study to show that there's a split, there's a lateral, a sideways step in the 30s for a lot of career women. Uh, on, you know, not surprisingly, when they come back from maternity leave, on average, a very generalized pattern, they take on staff roles and they grow within staff roles. You can make it far, but you'll never be the chair of the board, right? Because of that. So these are some of the, the issues at play that you're know, going back to, to, the, to the temporal perspective. You have to solve this when someone is right out of uni, right out of college, when they start their careers. But well, we're trying to solve it in the back and when these patterns, these systemic patterns have already taken place. Yeah. But well, you have to preempt them. That's what we're not doing. That requires a long-term perspective though that we, that we don't have. Yeah. But very, yeah, very valid point. Okay. Uh, I'm conscious of the time, but I also know that we can be a little bit flexible with the schedule because we're all in the room right now. Uh, so if we uh, have another question, uh, yes. And just while this prepares, we will push everything back 10 minutes and catch it up at lunch. I think we'll be able to manage with that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful presentations, everyone. Uh, my question is for Sergio. Uh, I know that your company or your organization has like a four-year program or something like that, that we enroll or the leadership people enroll and they have workshops and this kind of um, all the a preparation to succeed. So my question is, what kind of outreach the organization is doing uh, towards the students and universities? Have you ever thought about an internship program uh, for you know connecting these wonderful leaders and mentors yeah. with the students? Thank you. Yeah, I'll go a bit into. Um... I'm actually working on an investor deck right now on, on that. So what we're doing now is really focusing on leadership development, people to break through into the senior leadership layers, right? But what we want to grow out to is to be the leading uh, learning and development platform for ethnic professionals. So we're we're starting with a student. Um, it's not a training. It's more for students to get inside information into companies. We see a lot that, especially ethnic students, they don't have anybody in the family that works in a big company. So they're like, oh, yeah, but if I go and work there, I'm not going to fit in. I have to drink beer every Friday. That's not me. Like they have all these presumptions. So they're not even applying. So companies are throwing this budget to reach them, but they're not applying because they're like, yeah, I'm not going to fit in there anyway going to work for the government because that's where I know somebody and that's so we're setting up the platform uh, where you have ethnic professionals from all the companies that we work with uh, and students can just scroll through their profile see a little intro video and then book a one-on-one -on -one, 30 minute one-on-one -on -one to ask like hey what is culture really like there and how did you get in and if I want to apply how does it work you know to have like a family member that they don't have so that's for students and then we're coming up with a, um, a future leaders program. So for early career, and then we're also coming up with an executive program actually, because a big problem that we see, and I call this like going through the pain, right? And it, and it comes back to what you're saying. So now you have one minority on the board or maybe two, then it doesn't function yet. Actually, it, it functions less well, right? Because now it's them versus me. And all of it, all of the time I'm representing this whole community, but I'm just one voice, right? So it's very tiring and it's also not functioning yet. So, so we're um, going to start this executive program to work with those executives on, you know, how can they become better role models, but mostly that they don't feel alone and that they can spar with others doing the same thing in other companies. Um, I think in my experience, working in diverse teams, it works when everybody's the minority, right? When, you know, even if you have, you know, six white men and two women and that even those six white men feel as the minority because they're from different parts of the country or they're from, you know, coming from very diverse backgrounds. Because I think when you feel like a minority, that's when you listen and you're like, oh, wait, I'm just one perspective here. Let me listen and see what's going on rather than, oh, this 
she's always complaining, you know, like we all agree, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, you know, screw that other opinion. Uh, that's not what you want. That's not functioning. So, but you have to go through the pain to get there. I want to comment on that because in my uh, board experience, I was a minority, but also part of the majority, depending on the theme, you know, there's particularly uh, the educated majority, we have higher uh, education degrees, and then being the young person, I would be the minority. And um, what happens often is, or what I saw, is that when I'm the minority, I realize that the majority doesn't have um, coaching how to deal with the minority. Because you can put, you know, a woman, uh, LGBTQIA, uh, how do you deal with that? How do you make conversations sensible? Because otherwise you really get that us versus them in that board and really it doesn't work, right? Um, and it's, we have to realize that systems are in place and people that are in the majority position have a feeling that they've earned their position right there. They are unaware of the fact that that position is a position oftentimes of privilege and um, can they cannot see how underprivileged people have to suffer in addition to get to the same spot. So if it's, it, it boils down to this very, very personal understanding on how things really work. Um, to give an example, if someone has to come here in Curacao, it's very common for everyone to aspire to get a car. Why? Not because we are so, uh, we hate the environment so much that everyone has to have a car. But try standing in the sun. You guys walked yesterday in the in the. <laughs> try standing in that sun wearing you know uh, uh, the, the the regalia that you have to wear to go to work, getting a bus. You know, sitting in next to people that are doing countless other jobs. You know, it's uncomfortable when you reach. You're not there on time, so it. Not everyone understands it because not everyone took the bus, and get that discussion in the boardroom, and then you'll see how diversity will actually pan out. And so to summarize, the people that are already there also need coaching. They they don't know how to work with these new tools that we're giving them, so. Unfortunately, I have to wrap it up there. Sorry, uh, but I'm sure we can continue talking. So yes, I, I'd like to thank our three panelists. Uh, it's been, I guess, wonderful to hear uh, Curacao perspectives uh, that have um, expanded all over the world, uh, people really uh, building change uh, and transforming institutions. So thank you very much. It's been a, a pleasure. So uh, we're off now to parallel sessions. Um, if you are a poster session delegate, could you please just see Tamsin on the way out just to make sure that we've got you all set up and uh, ready to go. But um, thanks again. Music that feels I do. Working on the weekend till half past two. Have you bought every product on TV? Come on over here, everything is free. Oh.